How's O'Brien's car coming, Steve? I'm on it right now, Leo. Bert's gonna help out. Fine. Where is he? Don't look now, but here I am. But I think Steve's gonna need more stuff than that when he gets to checking the regulator. Nah, Bert. All he needs in addition to that is a jumper and a hydrometer. <laughs> Looks like you're figuring on a short somewhere, Steve. I wish it were that easy, Leo. The battery's fairly new. It's recharged twice and it's down again. Maybe it leaks. Uh, I checked that. The battery's okay. I put her on the charger and she came right up to snuff. If it ain't the wiring, it's the generator. Could be, Steve. Could be. But don't shut your eyes to the generator regulator. You know the regulator can make a good battery look awful bad. I was afraid of that. How come? Why? Well, Steve is busier than Blazes with electrical work. I'd like to help him out, but all I know about a regulator wouldn't help him a bit. Uh, could you kind of wise me up? Why, sure, I'd be glad to, Bert. It's all explained in this reference book. But uh, while Steve checks this job, let's talk about how the regulator works. But remember, you can make all the tests to see if it's working properly without even taking off the cover. Yeah, why take the cover off if there's no need for it? Besides, you might get dirt in it. If you do have to take it off to make adjustments, clean the dirt off the cover so nothing will fall into the regulator. And never take the cover off to make an adjustment while the engine's running. Because if it touches the circuit breaker, you'll get a short and wreck the whole unit. Glad you mentioned that point, Tex. Some guys play safe and always remove the battery cable from the negative post before they take off the cover. Yeah, that way you'll be sure you don't cause a short. Now, Bert, you can see that the regulator is nothing more than three magnetic switches called relays combined into a single unit. Each one has a spring-loaded contact arm called an armature that opens or closes a set of contact points. And those are mighty important points, fella. Just wait and see. Right. And this unit, with the copper contact arm and the heavy wire winding, is the circuit breaker we mentioned before. And there's a finer winding underneath that that you can't see. The unit next to it, the middle one, is the current regulator. It has one heavy wire winding and a couple of turns of smaller wire. The third unit is the voltage regulator. It has many turns of fine wire, and they're usually wrapped in paper. How come three units? Why, what do you expect? There's three different kinds of jobs to do. Tex right, Bert, and the circuit breaker has the simplest job. It acts like a check valve, which permits water to flow just one way from pump to storage tank, and doesn't let it flow back out when the pump stops working. Yeah. In our circuit, the generator is like the pump, the circuit breaker is the check valve, and the battery is the storage tank. You see, Bert, the circuit breaker contact points are held open by spring tension on the armature when the generator isn't putting out or charging. But when the generator begins to push current through the circuit breaker windings, it creates magnetism strong enough to pull the contact points together. And when that happens, you get a direct hookup between the generator and battery so that the battery starts to get charged up and the headlights, radio, ignition, and so forth pull current from the generator instead of the battery. But when the generator slows down or stops, its output drops. Current then starts to flow from the battery to generator because the battery has about six volts pressure and the generator has almost none. This weakens the magnetic pull at the circuit breaker. So the armature spring pulls the points apart, breaking the circuit. That stops the battery from losing its charge through the generator. Now, to go on to the next switch, that current regulator is like a governor valve, which keeps the rate of water flow from going up too high and damaging the pump. Yeah, in the same way, the current regulator controls the flow of electricity to keep it from getting high enough to damage the generator. It's really needed with today's generators. They're pretty powerful units, and they'll burn themselves out if you let them. Say, looks like the points on this current regulator are stuck. <laughs> no, Bert. This is different from the circuit breaker. The spring on this armature holds the points closed. 
That's so that when the generator puts out a flow of electricity above the rated output on the nameplate, the magnetism pulls the points apart. With the points open, it puts a resistance or a detour in the field circuit of the generator, which weakens the field and cuts down the generator output. Then, the reduced output cuts down the magnetism in the current regulator, so the points come together again. Incidentally, the points open and close a lot of times each second. That keeps the current flow from going up or down very far. Instead, it stays right on the best rate to protect the generator. The voltage regulator is almost the same as the current regulator. It keeps the pressure of electricity at an even, steady push. It's just the same as a relief valve in a water system. That's right, Tech. If water is pumped at pressure too great for pipes or storage tanks, they may give way under the strain. The valve keeps the pressure down. This voltage regulator does the same kind of a job. It keeps electricity from pushing too hard, burning out wires, bulbs, and distributor points, and damaging the battery by overcharging. What makes it do that? It's simple, Bert. Just magnetism again. When you got too much voltage going through the winding, the magnetism is strong enough and pulls against the spring that's holding the point closed. So, the point's open. But that puts resistance in the field circuit of the generator, which cuts down the pressure and the flow. And you go into that on and off business like you did on the current regulator. These carbon bars mounted on the bottom of the regulator are called resistors. They're the resistances that the current and voltage regulators cut in and out of the generator field circuit as their points open and close. If you think that one of these resistors is faulty or broken, replace it. It's easy to do and the cost is small. Getting back to the voltage regulator, it allows high output when the battery's low and cuts it down when the battery comes up to full charge. This happens because the generator produces about seven and three tenths volts pressure, and the low battery has only about six and a half volts pressure. It's easy then for current to flow from generator to battery. Now, when the battery is fully charged, its voltage goes to about six and nine tenths. The generator pressure is still about seven volts. That's why the battery resists taking a charge as fast as it did when its pressure was low. I get you. When one's low and the other's high, current flows from high to low until it's almost even. Right. Now, just to sum it all up, when the battery's low and lights are on, the pressure or voltage won't get high enough to get the voltage regulator going. So, the generator keeps putting out until it builds up enough current to start the current regulator. This stops output from going higher and protects the generator. Yep. And... As your battery comes up to charge and the lights are turned off, the voltage will increase. This starts the voltage regulator going. That cuts pressure down, which in turn cuts output down. So the current regulator stops working. So you see, the two work together to control the generator output. So it gives out the right current at the right voltage. That way, Battery overcharge and high voltage are both prevented by the regulator units. That regulator really does a big job. You said it. Speaking of jobs, let's see how Steve's doing while somebody turns this record over. How's it coming, Steve? Well, it's the regulator, all right. I checked the battery to make sure it read 1275. What would you do if it wasn't fully charged? Well, if I didn't have a fully charged one to use instead, I put this carbon power resistor in series with a battery and ammeter to give a resistance like I'd get with a fully charged battery. The reference book explains that hookup, Bert. And that's important, because the generator current and all your meter readings won't add up right unless you have a fully charged battery condition in the circuit. Okay. Uh, what happened next, Steve? I cleaned up all the generator circuit connections. How were the regulator mounting screws? Nice and tight. The paint was cleaned off, and the regulator had a good, solid grind. Then what did you do? I followed the quick check in this service reference book, hooked up my ammeter and voltmeter, just like it showed, and ran the engine for about 15 minutes. And I didn't have to take the cover off to make the test. Then I grounded this regulator field lead to the regulator ground screw, 
And yet, Miami, what does grounding that field lead do? It gives a shortcut around the regulator so that it no longer controls the generator output. The generator can then come up to its maximum capacity for the speed it's running. But take a tip from me. Don't run your engine too fast with the field grounded. You might burn off the generator. When you grounded the lead, Steve, what did your test ammeter show? Well, it was well within the range of the generator output. And stayed that way even when I turned on all the lights, heater, and radio. So I knew O'Brien's generator was okay. So now I'm going to test the regulator. Suppose we let Steve finish the job, Bert, while you and Tech and I discuss some other things to check inside the regulator. Now, Bert, dirty points, wrong air gaps, or wrong spring tensions will put a regulator out of adjustment. If these points are burned, dress them down with a file. Take it easy now. You don't have to bear down. And remember to use a clean file, one that's used for regulator points only. Remember, if you have to file the points, and that doesn't happen often, clean them off by drawing a piece of bond paper between the points. You use this flat gauge next to check the armature air gap with the contact points open. It should be 31 to 34 thousandths of an inch. And be sure you slide it in as close to the hinge as you can. But why? Because the armature sets across the core at an angle. The gap is bigger on the point side when the points are open. Now, Bert, this brass hook is the armature stop. That's what you bend to get the proper air gap. And look, when you bend this stop, make sure the armature doesn't rub against the side of it when you're finished. Gauge the point gap to see if it's at least 15 thousandths of an inch. Too wide a gap would keep the points from closing when they should. You adjust the gap by spreading or squeezing the supports of the stationary bridge. But be sure both points line up when you're done. Say, Leo, do the clearances vary for different kinds of regulators? No, they're all the same for these VRP-type regulators. There's a data and specifications chart in this reference book that'll give you all the dope. Now, if the current and voltage regulator points need it, File them the same as I did the circuit breaker. Then check the gaps. Your armature air gaps should be 48 to 52 thousandths of an inch. And they've got to be gauged on the point side, right next to the small armature stop ribbon. Say, looks like Steve's all finished. Uh-oh, and I was supposed to help. A lot of help you guys were standing around shooting the breeze. It's a good thing some guys do all the work. My, my, sounds like you had trouble. Nah, I'm only kidding. O'Brien's current regulator was cutting off at 20 amps. He told me he does a lot of night driving. Naturally, his lights and radio are turned on. The lights draw about 15 amps, the radio 7, and the ignition 4. That's 26 amps he draws, and his current regulator was set to put back only 20 amps. So his battery ran right down. Well, how did you get that 20 amps, Steve? Easy. I just hooked my test ammeter in the circuit, Turned on all the lights, the radio, and started the car. And when I grounded the field, I got well within the range of generator output. But when I didn't ground the field, I got only 20 amps. This meant that my current regulator wasn't set to let enough current go through when the regulator was controlling the generator. So I knew I'd have to take the cover off and adjust it. So I took off the battery cable. Hey, you're one of those guys who always remove that cable before taking off the regulator cover. Yeah. I like to be sure that I won't short out the regulator. And besides, the cable's easy to remove on this model. Now, from my ammeter reading, I know that the spring tension on my current regulator's armature must be too light. So I bent the lower spring hanger down to increase the tension. That keeps the contact points together until enough current flows through the winding. I watched the meter while I bent the spring hanger and got the output to come up to its rated capacity. Then I stopped the engine, took off the battery cable, covered the regulator, replaced the cable, and checked my reading again. Why did you have to recheck it with the cover on? Because the cover affects the temperature and magnetism of the unit. Naturally, you want the proper readings with the cover on. You see, Bert, setting that regulator is like regulating a water valve where you watch the gauge until you get the right amount of flow through the pipe. How is the voltage regulator setting, Steve? Right on the button, Leo. I had my voltmeter connected in the circuit, ran my engine, and read the dial. 
7.2 volts is what we hit. 7.1 to 7.3 is what we're allowed. What if it were lower? Then I'd bend the lower spring hanger down. That increases spring tension and keeps the points from popping open until enough volts go through the windings. If my voltmeter's high, I'd bend the hanger up to let the points pop open sooner. Say, aren't you supposed to change the voltage setting in hot climates? Why, no. We set our voltage regulator within the specified limits. You know, some shops have a neat-looking bench set up for adjusting regulators. Yes, and they're a big help if you have a lot of regulator work. Well, this pretty well winds up O'Brien's car, doesn't it? Yes, but uh, supposing O'Brien's battery was overcharged. Well, you mean it took too much water, burnt the lamps and stuff? Exactly, Steve. Well, your checks are the same. Overcharging simply means that the regulator points are staying closed too long, either because of spring tension being too strong or because of a buildup of metal on the contact. The thing to remember is, if you go through the test and make the proper settings to bring the operation of each unit up to the rated output, you'll correct for overcharge or undercharge at the same time. But what if you check everything and it still don't work? Well, then it's a faulty unit. So take it off and put on another one. That all sounds easy to you, but I'd have to go over it a couple of times before I'd feel sure that I could do it myself. I know what you mean, Bert, so at our meeting tonight, I'm going to read this reference book over with you and the fellas, word for word. And then we'll do the tests and make each hookup step by step. Nice going, Leo. That's a swell way to run a meeting. And if you're as thorough with Steve, we'll have no owner comebacks. People will have confidence in us, and we'll stay way ahead in service business. Thanks, Tech. Are you getting ready to shove her? Yeah, Leo. I gotta see a man about a break. So long for now, and good luck with your meeting. <laughs>